Hi, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Bench's Book Reviews. What's in the box today? It is a bit stiff, but it contains oh, Tales from Beatrix Potter, the original and authorised editions, and it's by Beatrix Potter, as you may expect. Um, let's see, now this is Tales, has more than one. Uh, I've done before, I've done the Tailor of Gloucester, which you can watch on this channel, uh, but today we'll do the tale of Mrs. Tiggywinkle. I guess that's technically the tale of the Tailor of Gloucester, but it's just called the Tale of Gloucester, probably to avoid confusion. So we'll do the tale of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, and that's on page 43. Um, the Tale of Gloucester one is actually longer than expected, so it's possible I will abort this in the middle if it's getting very long, but we'll see. Uh, page 43 doesn't exist in the book, that's unfortunate. This book is missing some pages. Um, so we could start on page 45, or we could do another story. Let's start on page 45, we're only missing two pages. I'll just guess what it says on those. So it probably says something like, there once was a uh, porcupine or something called Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, and she did something. And then we get into it. If that's not true, we can always revise how we think the first two pages go. I mean, there aren't many, many clues. Well, there's a girl in a farmyard here, so maybe that's how it starts. There was a girl, and she was in a farmyard. Here we go, then. The kitten, so the kitten will have been introduced on pages 43 or 44, I expect. The kitten went on washing her white paws, so she's been washing her white paws. So I don't think we've missed much. We're getting enough context here. So Lucy, that will be the little girl here. So we've got Lucy and a kitten, and obviously now some hens. So Lucy asked a speckled hen. Speckled hens are quite popular in children's books. It's almost the only place you hear the word speckled uh, in the context of hens. Although other things can be speckled. You get speckled Easter eggs. I don't know if those are just because uh, hens lay eggs. And so people think it's nice if the speckled nature of the hens is also reflected in the painting of the egg. Or if they just come out speckled, actually, that's possible. I'm not sure. I mean, you get people who are freckled, but that's, um, well, that's kind of similar to being speckled. It's different. I guess speckled is, is the feather colouring and freckling is on the skin, so it is actually quite different. Being speckled is more like having um, variegated hair, which people do do if, if they, um, they dye bits of it. I think it's something called highlights. Uh, it's possible. Anyway, so there's a speckled hen. Sally Henny Henny. That must be the name of the hen. Have you found three pocket handkins? Um, if you watched the previous video, The Tale of Gloucester, you'll know that some of the language in this is rather old fashioned. So a handkin probably means a handkerchief, I guess. I'll try to keep up as best as I can, but it's possible that I will. Um, misunderstand a word or two. So have you found three pocket handkins? But that's nice, like straight away we get in clues as to what's happened. So probably there's Lucy looking for three pocket handkerchiefs. But the speckled hen ran into a barn. Um, that probably means ran into the barn rather than crashing into the side of the barn. That happens in another book uh, where an owl flies into a tree. I can link that up here. Um, and I think it means lands in the tree, and here I think it's similar, this this owl, uh, this is not an owl, this is a hen, and it's ran into the barn, I think. Clucking. I go barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. Well, that suggests that a pocket hanky might be a sock then, because if this is like negating, like saying no to the question, I haven't got pocket handkins. I'm barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. So I don't need three pocket handkins. Um, but we'll see. 
that may just be a bit of a random answer. The hen can talk though, that's interesting. It's not wearing clothes. Um, certain animals in this Beatrix Potter universe do wear clothes, but this hen, well, it doesn't just go barefoot, it goes completely naked. And also doesn't seem to have a handkerchief. And then Lucy asked Cock Robin, sitting on a twig. Cock Robin, I guess, is just the, the, the male Robin. Um, so another bird. Cock Robin looked sideways at Lucy with his bright black eye, and he flew over a stile and away. So he didn't even say no, he just implicitly gave Lucy to believe that the answer was no. Lucy climbed up on the stile. Style is spelled with an I, I think that is correct. Think about turnstiles, probably. And looked up at the hill behind Little Town. A hill that goes up, up into the clouds as though it had no top. So Little Town, but big hill. And a great way up the hillside, she thought she saw some white things spread upon the grass. Um, you can't really see the hill. I think she's on the stile there in the picture. It's Lucy with an IE, which is also um, quite old fashioned. I think most Lucy's nowadays would probably use a Y. Lucy scrambled up the hill as fast as her stout legs would carry her. I don't think that's necessary. I'm saying she's got stout legs. Fair enough. She's a human, by the way. Did I mention that? She's just a little girl. Um, she's not a hen or anything. Uh, she ran along a steep pathway, up and up. I mean, here it says up and up, which was reminiscent of earlier. It said goes up, up, but there it says up, up, and here it's up and up. So actually, it might have been nicer to use the exact same phrase. Until Little Town. Oh, Little Town has a hyphen in it. I didn't realise that because it was at the end of a line, Little Dash Town, and I thought that was just a um a line break. Uh, but no, here it's in the middle of a line, and that does seem to be a hyphen. Little town. Okay. Though that might just be a, an error in the printing. Like they may have reformatted something, or reorganized uh, the paragraphs, and then... I don't know if you ever copied from a PDF into a Word document, you sometimes get annoying dashes where you have line breaks. Until Little Town was right away down below. She could have dropped a pebble down the chimney. The chimney of Little Town. I guess she just means she's higher than the chimneys. I mean, she's obviously very far away. So dropping in that way. But maybe it just looks like that. Maybe it feels like that. Or maybe she doesn't have very good depth perception. I mean, Cock Robin, with his bright black eye, he only has one eye. So he probably doesn't have very good depth perception. But you would expect Lucy... Um, to be able to understand that the town is far away if she's run up a hill away from it. Presently, they're capitalising the first word on every page, which is nice, so it says presently, uh, but it's not really. Presently, she came to a spring, bubbling out from the hillside. Someone, that's someone with a space in it, well, again, quite antiquated spellings, but I think for a non-native speaker, we're I would advise trying to get a copy with a slightly updated um, orthography because otherwise it just makes it harder to read, you know, if you think someone, and you're like, what does that mean? Someone had stood a tin can upon a stone to catch the water, but the water was already running over, for the can was no bigger than an egg cup. And more water than fits in an egg cup had already uh, flowed into it. And where the sand upon the path was wet, there were footmarks of a very small person. They have italicised very there, that's nice. Lucy ran on and on. Well, again, Beatrix Potter universe, very small person with a tiny little cup. Um, you kind of get the idea there's probably going to be some sort of animal behind this, either a mouse or a hare or a rabbit or something. Or possibly our protagonist, whose name I have forgotten, I believe it's Tiggy Winkle, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, maybe it's her. Though we still don't know what kind of animal she is. I think she might be a porcupine, but I might be getting that wrong. 
so we'll find out. The path ended under a big rock. Ended under a rock. How does a path end under a rock? You mean there's a rock blocking the path? Oh no, they mean there's a little door in the rock. So it's like going into the hillside. That's a useful illustration. It helps you understand the text better. Thumbs up for that. The grass was short and green, and there were clothes props cut from bracken stems with lines of plaited rushes and a heap of tiny clothes pins, but no pocket handkerchiefs. Oh no, because that's what she's been looking for. Here they actually write it out, pocket handkerchiefs. So maybe saying pocket handkins was just some sort of um, diminutive, like almost baby talk style. Because she did call the hen Henny Penny, which almost also may not be her real name. She might actually be called Sally Henderson. Um, but anyway, but there was something else. A door! Well, I revealed that in the picture. Straight into the hill, and inside it, someone, someone, was singing. Now again, there's a song here. I uh, had this in other videos. I don't always know the, the rhythm of these songs, but I'll do my best. Lily white and clean, oh, with little frills between. Oh, smooth and hot, red rusty spot, never here be seen. Oh, it's quite a nice song. Nice and punchy. Oh, what did it actually say? It wasn't really listening, I was concentrating. Lily white and clean. Okay, so it's doing some washing by the sounds of it. And those clothes props would also suggest that that's what's going on. Lucy, comma, Knocked, M dash once, M dash twice, comma. Weirdly punctuated, but again, I'm just going to assume it's old fashioned rather than illiterate. So Lucy knocked once, twice, and interrupted the song. Well, she was at least between verses. I mean, it could be an interruption, but there may not even be another verse. So it could be that she was finished. A little frightened voice called out, Who's that? Lucy opened the door. And what do you think there was inside the hill? Well, we think someone washing, someone small, possibly someone called Tiggy Winkle. Those are our three guesses, and they could all be right. Oh, and we think she's um, an animal of some sort. Oh, there she is. She's, I can see her. I think she's a hedgehog. Which I think is just based on my general absorption of Beatrix Potter lore. Um, even though I haven't read this book specifically, I've probably seen it on a shelf where you see these tea towels with Potter Universe characters on them. Um, so I think that's probably why, because Tiggy Winkle doesn't necessarily sound like a spiky animal. I guess Winkle has a K in it, which is a spiky sound. Anyway. Lucy opened the door, and what do you think there was inside the hill? A nice clean kitchen didn't guess that, with a flagged floor, I, think, I guess that means flagstones, and wooden beams, just like any other farm kitchen. Only the ceiling was so low that Lucy's head nearly touched it, and the pots and pans were small, and so was everything there. Well, that goes with our small water-collecting can from earlier. What's that thing? said Lucy. That's not my pocket handkin. Well, here she calls it a handkin again. No, just when she's excited. She says handkin. Oh no. Oh no. We're missing another two pages. I thought that was a bit abrupt. Oh, sorry about this. This book seems to be. I mean, I'm not going to say completely unreadable, but it's missing another two pages here. Pages 51 and 52. So one physical piece of paper, but with a front and a back. Okay, well, that's going to make it difficult to read, but I guess we'll get to the end faster. Um. I guess she's gone in and she's met this hedgehog and the hedgehog is holding something that Lucy thinks she recognises. And then, what's that thing? said Lucy. That's not my pocket handkin. That's with a question mark, so she says that's not, but she's kind of meaning, hey, that is, or that could be. Oh no, if you please them, that's a little scarlet waistcoat belonging to Cock Robin. And she ironed it and folded it and put it on one side. I guess that's not Lucy. I guess she is this person who is very likely to be Tiggy Winkle. Even if someone has removed the evidence of that from the text. Then she, the hedgehog, 
took something else off a clothes horse. That isn't my pinny, said Lucy. Oh no, if you please them, that's a damask tablecloth belonging to Jenny Wren. So Hedgehog here seems to be running some sort of laundrette for um, local birds. Look how it's stained with currant wine. It's very bad to wash, said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Well, there you go, that reveals what her name is. Um, Winkle is not got a capital W there, which I think is strange. I actually have a double barreled surname. It's Bench something. And the second barrel has a capital letter. I thought that was um, universal. But I guess not, not at least not in the Potter universe. Different universe. Um, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle's nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and she fetched another hot iron from the fire. Okay. Because she's kind of, you know, she's um, a hot iron. She's washing things, ironing them. As I say, some sort of washing service she's running up on the hill. There's one of my pocket hankins, cried Lucy. Oh, she's spotted one now. And there's my pinny. Mrs. Tinky Winkle ironed it and goffered it. No idea what that means. And shook out the frills. If anyone knows what goffered means, do put it in the comments. Oh, that is lovely, said Lucy. Oh, so she hasn't just pinched the things. She's washing them for Lucy. That's nice. And what are those long yellow things with fingers like gloves? Oh, that's a pair of stockings belonging to Sally Hennypenny. Well, that's weird, because I thought she went barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. I thought she meant that as though she always goes barefoot and she doesn't need socks or stockings. Uh, but I guess she was talking just in the, in the here and now. Look how she's worn the heels out with, that, with scratching in the yard. She'll very soon go barefoot, said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Well, she is going barefoot. Well, unless going barefoot is a weird usage that means I am running my socks through. As maybe that's what they mean by that. Who knows? Why, there's another Hantka sniff. Okay, that's another, that's a third variant. And it's just Lucy. Maybe Lucy is one of these people who um, trips over their words a bit or just plays. She could be doing it deliberately. So a handker sniff. Oh, that's quite funny because if you have a sniffly nose, you need the handkerchief to blow it. But it isn't mine. It's red. It's it's red. Oh no! If you please, them that one belongs to old Mrs. Rabbit. Don't know if that's Peter Rabbit's mum. Could be. And it did so smell of onions. I've had to wash it separately. I can't get out the smell. There's another one of mine," said Lucy. What are those funny little white things? So she's just going round, just commenting on all the all the things that are being washed. I'm not quite sure of the tone here, if she's being, like, um, critical, like, if she's being suspicious, like, hey, you've nicked all my stuff, like, what's this, what's this, what's this? Or if she's just being interested and saying, oh, wow, that's nice. Oh, that belongs to Wren, that belongs to Robin. Um, I don't know. Wren and Robin, fun fact, are two birds that both have famous Christophers named after them. Uh, as is Cockhole. What are those funny little white things? That's a pair of mittens belonging to Tabby Kitten. Oh, so she doesn't just service birds, because rabbit, obviously, a rodent, is it? And kitten is uh, a feline, a mammal, a cat. Rodents are mammals, I think. Uh, but anyway, a very different, uh, different subclass, or whatever you call it. Uh, that's a pair of mittens. I don't mean an underclass when I say subclass. I just mean um, like a different subcategory within the mammal kingdom. Anyways, there's mittens for a kitten. That's cute. Rhymes. I don't know why kittens always have to wear mittens. Rabbits don't. I don't know if anything rhymes with rabbit. I guess that's why they just have handker sniffs. Uh, so I only have to iron them. She washes them herself. Okay, so she does... So it's not just full service. She does whichever bits. I don't know if she has, like, itemization. Or if you pay the same price, whatever you need. She hasn't really discussed payment. 
Oh, and then Lucy said, there's my last pocket handkin, said Lucy. So she's found them all then, that's good. And what are you dipping into the basin of starch? There's a picture of a hedgehog dipping something into a basin of starch. By basin, it's like a little bowl, it's probably called that nowadays. Like it's not a thing you wash your hands in in the bathroom, it's a more like a bowl. They're little dicky shirt fronts belonging to Tom Titmouse. Not met him in any of the other stories yet. Most terrible peculiar. A shirt front. Now, need the tailor of Gloucester to help us out here with what some of these things are. Said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Now I've finished my ironing, I'm going to air some clothes. I guess the starch is when things need to be really crisply ironed. You have to dip them in the starch. Oh, they're sitting drinking some tea now. That's a nice picture. Then Mrs. Tiggywinkle made tea. A cup for herself and a cup for Lucy. It doesn't say if she uses a central pot or if she um, does two separate cups with her own bags. And it's not clear from the picture. Oh, there's some sort... Well, that could just be a kettle. I'm not sure. They sat before the fire. Nowadays you'd say in front of the fire. That's quite an old-fashioned usage of before. Which is normally used tempor temporally nowadays. But it seems to have been used... Uh, I'm not sure. Locally? Is that what you say? Like, as, a, as a preposition of location. Uh, in these days. I can give you the year this was first published. If you're interested in how long it's taken for the usage of before to change. Uh, well, it's a bit tricky because it was first published in many years. 1903, 05, 08, 09, the original text, by the look of it. So we're looking at over 100 years. Um, before the fire on a bench, and that's my name, and looked sideways at one another. I mean, they've, they've turned their bodies, not just going like that. Um, they're sitting how you would sit on a bench to chat. They're not, like, giving each other the, the side eye. Mrs. Tiggywinkle's hand, holding the teacup, was very, very brown. And very, very wrinkly with the soap suds. I think it's just brown because that's the colour of a hedgehog rather than that she's got dirt on it from washing. And all through her gown and her cap, there were hairpins sticking wrong end out, so that Lucy didn't like to sit too near her. Well, they say that, but I think she's just a hedgehog, so those are just the hedgehog spines. I think those are really hairpins. That may just be how Lucy's... Um, she may not have realised she's talking to a hedgehog. Possible? That is just about possible, because the hens in her farmyard weren't wearing clothes, so maybe she sees a clothes-wearing being and assumes it's human. Maybe she doesn't come a lot across a lot of clothes-wearing hedgehogs. Just checking. Oh, I, oh, yeah. I was just saying, I was just checking if any pages have been missing, and there were a couple of pages missing between the, uh, the clothes airing and then the, the tea drinking. But it's probably just, she probably just airs the clothes and it says, who's that for? She'll say, this is for, um, you know, some little animal, maybe. A, what could it be? Uh, a newt, perhaps? Nick, newt, or field mouse, Fred, Fred the field mouse? I don't know. Could be another bird. Charlie Chaffinch. I really don't know. I also don't know if he's crossover. Like she mentions Mrs. Rabbit, and there's a rab Peter Rabbit has a mum who was probably called Mrs. Rabbit, um, and I quite like that when there's a bit of crossover. They do it in the Mister Men books as well, um, but I don't know like if Tom Titmouse has his own story or um, Tabby Kitten. They're not not some of the most famous ones. If they do, anyway, so. Okay, they've drunk the tea. I'm sorry about these gaps. I mean, it's not really my fault. This is an old book. Oh dear, we're going to miss loads more pages as well. 
Well, in some ways, this is nice because it means if you do get your own copy of the book, if you don't get this one, uh, you can read the whole story and you'll actually it'll be a bit more exciting for you. On most of my reviews, I review the whole book and then you might say, well, what's the point of that? I don't have to read it now. But I, I've not had any negative comments about that so far. But um, do let me know if there's a complete waste of time with all the missing pages and I can try to make sure I read more coherently uh, paginated books in the future. Um, but let's keep going. So they've drunk some tea. When they had finished tea, well, that's nice. That suggests we haven't missed anything out there. So I'm just going to have a little drink of this. When they had finished tea, all this talk of tea making me thirsty. Uh, they tied up the clothes in bundles. Oh, so Lucy's helping now. She's been conscripted. And Lucy's pocket handkerchiefs were folded up inside her clean pinny and fastened with a silver safety pin. And then they made up the fire with turf. I guess the kind of peat, one of these peat fires. Um, you know, don't know if they're in Ireland. Or like where we get peat. Anywhere boggy, I guess. And came out and locked the door. I think Scotland probably has peat as well. And locked the door and hid the key under the door sill. The door sill. Don't hear about that very much. Window sills are still very much in common usage. Just kind of shoving it under the door. Then away down the hill trotted Lucy and Mrs. Tiggywinkle with the bundles of clothes. That's nice. All the way down the path, little animals came out of the fern to meet them. The very first that they met were Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny. Well, Peter Rabbit, I've reviewed the tale of Peter Rabbit. There it is. Um, do check that out. So there is crossover then, quite clear crossover. That's nice. Benjamin Bunny, I'm pretty sure he has a book as well, though I've not read it. Okay, so yeah, well, we kind of got the idea that's what Tiggy Winkle was up to. So that's nice how she's out delivering. And she gave them their nice clean clothes. So I'm just checking. Yeah, no missing page. And she gave them their nice clean clothes. There's a robin. That could be cock robin. And there's also some sort of blue tit and a bunch of mice. I don't know if either, any of them are Tom. And all the little animals and birds were so very much obliged to dear Mrs. Tiggywinkle. I don't know if she does it pro bono or if she's paid. May have paid in advance. So that at the bottom of the hill... When they came to the stile, there was nothing left to carry except Lucy's one little bundle. It's a bit mysterious, though, the way she didn't know that she that Tiggy Wingle had her handkerchiefs. Like, the other animals seem to have made some sort of um, deal, like an arrangement. Like, said, hey, can you sort me out? Whereas Lucy seems to have had someone do that for her. Lucy scrambled up the stile with the bundle in her hand, and then she turned to say... Good night, and to thank the washerwoman. That's Tiggywinkle. But what a very odd thing. Mrs. Tiggywinkle had not waited, either for thanks or for the washing bill. So she hasn't paid in advance, where she didn't even seem to know they were being washed. She was running, running, running. Now they've not put commas in between running. That's cool, because this is otherwise quite a heavily punctuated book. But running happens quickly. So to just add that bit of speed to the sentence, they've deliberately omitted any punctuation so it says she was running 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 up the hill and where was her white frilled cap and her shawl and her gown and her petticoat we don't know because there's a bunch more pages missing and the next thing is talking about jemima puddle duck who i believe is not even part of this story well that's a cliffhanger isn't it where was her White frill cap, and her shawl, and her gown, and her petticoat. We don't know. Well, that makes it quite an exciting ending to this book review. Um, I may, one day, let me know in the comments again if you would like me to do this, uh, dig out or find or borrow from a different library another copy of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle with no pages missing, or at least with the end pages included, and then we could do a little follow-up to this and see what happens. Uh, so that's exciting. But yeah, I quite like that. I mean, obviously, the story is somewhat disjointed, so it's hard to pass too much comment on the flow of the narrative, uh, because I don't know exactly what was uh, on the missing pages. Although, I must give credit to Potter that even with the pages missing, I was able to follow the story that you can... 
you know, you get some stories where wild characters get introduced and you, it's hard to even follow from one page to the next, even if you have all the pages. But this is very much not the case here, where we um, can follow the thread of what is going on uh, in spite of the omissions. So that was that. So I am quite pleased with that. I quite liked Lucy. Though, as I say, I don't know... Well, it seemed to be a very friendly relationship, but it's, it's quite confusing as to how this Tiggy Winkle has got her hands on Lucy's handkerchiefs. Um, there could be some force operating in the background who has, like, uh, purloined Lucy's handkerchiefs, passed them on to Tiggy Winkle for washing. And, like, maybe, like, trying to do a nice surprise for Lucy, you know, but um, maybe not reckoned with Lucy stumbling upon the washerwoman's lair or den. Laundrette, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what a hedgehog's house is called, I'm afraid, but where they do their washing may even be called something else anyway. So that's no good to you. But nice to know Tiggy Winkle is helping Rabbit. And yeah, and I like when Peter Rabbit shows up, you know, it means well, we're all in the same universe. Um, so that's kind of cool. Although it does mean that you should need to really look out for consistencies. But I didn't notice anything that couldn't necessarily have happened in any of the other Potter books I've read. So I'm happy. I am happy. Well done, Beatrix Potter. And I understood a lot more of the vocab, I should say, in that than in um, the Tale of Gloss one. I think the Tale of Gloss also had a lot of very tailor specific jargon, whereas here it was things like clothes, horse, uh, iron. Gofford was one I didn't know. That was like a washerwoman uh, jargon term. But most of it was a lot easier than the Taylor of Gloucester. So that was nice. Accessible even for a 21st century audience. But assuming you're prepared to roll with some of the punches like using before to mean in front of. Okay then. That's it. I'm done. Join me again next time for another of Mr. Ventures book reviews. Bye.